Hey, my name is Sean Jensen. I'm the pastor here at Authentic Church. We're so glad you came out. If it's your first time, if you're watching online, can we give it up for all our first-time guests and whoever it is? Thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, before we move forward, I do want to let you know in March, I want to tell you about something. Uh, we are starting a series. Now listen, we know that a lot of times we don't feel like where we want to be at. Sometimes we feel dissatisfied, like we feel apathetic, we feel stuck. And sometimes we got to realize that God has put us on a journey not to loathe, but to enjoy. Yeah, you're like, yeah, sure. Okay, cool. I'm, not enjoy I'm already thinking about the next step. And so we decided as a church in March, we're going to start this brand new series called Enjoy the Movie. And we're going to talk about how we can learn to enjoy our life. It's going to be encouraging. I would bring a friend and someone who feels down and out. Do not miss this series starting in March. I am pumped for it. It's just going to be so encouraging. It's probably going to be like the most encouraging. Like I might turn into Joel Osteen for a little bit. We'll see. You. I'm going to, hey, guys. Anyway, so I'm not making fun of him, I'm just saying, he's like one of the most positive people I've ever seen in my life. Enjoy the movie. So uh, we're going to continue on. We're in Swipe Right. We're in uh, week three of a series we're calling Swipe Right as we talk about the life and death power of sex and romance. In the first week, we talked about sex and everything about it, how God created it and designed it. If you are here and you're a believer in Christ, we talked about if you're a follower of Christ, then we are called to keep our marriage bed pure. And if you haven't, that you can be redeemed and do that as well. And so we talked about that it is a powerful thing. It's a pleasurable thing, but a powerful thing. The same thing that can bring life is the same thing that can bring death and destruction. And so we put it in its proper place. And last week, we escaped the cougar's attack. Right, everybody? We learned how to give away from temptation, how we can do it. All of this is on our YouTube. And I believe today, I am so excited. I have a word from God. I cannot wait to share it because some of you have been listening to this and you feel maybe you're watching online or you're here. You feel already you're in guilt. You're in shame. You feel stuck. Like, Sean, I know you've been talking about these things, but I've already made too many bad decisions. I have too many scars. I have too many regrets. I, this sounds amazing, but I just, I just don't know if I can get there. I feel stuck. I want that. But I don't know, because I have some setbacks in my life. I'm here to tell you today, you will be encouraged before you leave today. Do you have faith to believe that God can speak to your situation and what he wants to do? I am so ready. So let's jump right in. We're going to talk about this guy named Samson. Everyone say Samson. Samson was in the Old Testament. He was in the book of Judges where we're going to be at. And he was one of the judges over Israel, God's people, before kings. He helped lead them and take care of them and protect them from the enemy called the Philistines. And God rose Samson up. He was the strongest man and the most, most powerful man to live in that time. Super strong. And God made him a covenant. He said, you will remain strong as long as you never cut your hair. As long as you don't cut your hair and your hair is long, you will remain strong. So if you want a good picture of today's modern picture of what Samson looked like, I brought one for you. This is Samson. <laughs> Ladies, calm down. <laughs> Ladies, like, husbands, we better grab your wives right now. Like, we just talked about this, where your eye looks at. Like, Sean, you can't do this to me. So let's leave that up. And this is Samson. I, got, I like a good illustration. He was powerful. He was strong. There is a moment where a lion attacks him, and he catches the lion by the jaw and rips his jaw apart. There's a moment where he gets so upset with the Philistines that he catches 300 foxes, ties their tails together, puts a torch with flame on it, and sends them off in their vineyards, killing all of their crops. They need to make a movie about that. That is epic. <laughs> Not just that, he kills a thousand Philistines, listen, a thousand Philistines with a jawbone of a donkey. The Old Testament says of a, well, it's a donkey. So, uh, well, a thousand Philistines with a jawbone. He was strong. But listen, as strong as the man he was, he still had a weakness. He had a weakness. You know, even the most powerful men and women have weaknesses. Stuart Mann had kryptonite, right? He may have been powerful against man, but Samson was weak when it came to the ladies. He was. He made some poor decisions. You can see throughout his life, he made some bad decisions, and he ended up with this woman named Delilah, who ended up tricking him into telling the secret of where he gets his strength from. He ends up telling her, and she shaves his head in the middle of the night while he's sleeping, and then the Philistines the next morning overtake him because he's powerless. Ladies, God, the temptation, I'm telling you what, I've seen the temptation of sex being the strongest men to the weakest points. And so as soon as she did this, she tricked him, she cut off his hair. Samson went from this to this. <laughs> Who watched the Super Bowl this year? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You might want to check that commercial out. And this is where it takes place. So he is now taken captive. Judges 16. It's lengthy, but it's going to be good. Listen to this. 
So the Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza, where he bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. But before long, his hair began to grow back. The Philistine rulers held a great festival, offering sacrifices, praising their god, Dagon. They said, our god has given us victory over our enemy, Samson. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy to us. The one who killed so many of us is now in our power. Half drunk, so tipsy, by now the people demand, Bring out Samson so he can amuse us. So he was brought from the prison to amuse them, and they had him stand between the pillars supporting the roof. <laughs> nice. Samson said to the young servant who was leading him by the hand, Place my hands against the pillars that hold up the temple. I want to rest against them. Now the temple was completely full of people. All the Philistine rulers were there, and there were about 3,000 men and women on the roof were watching as Samson amused them. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me again. Oh God, please strengthen me just one more time. With one blow, let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. Then Samson put his hands on the two center pillars that held up the temple. Pushing against them with both hands, he prayed, let me die with the Philistines. And the temple crashed down on the Philistine rulers and all the people. So he killed more people than when he died than he had during his entire lifetime. We see this moment of redemption. We see this setback turn into a comeback. We see that even though he was at his weakest, God still used him. And I believe God can still use you if you are in your weakest point today. I want to pray real fast. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit in this place. Thank you for the baptism that we celebrated. Let us never forget that your spirit is our strength. And Lord, I pray for everyone who's here, first time, hundred time, that we would lean into this word because it's for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I love sports, and uh, I don't know if you guys know who this guy is. I'm going to give you guys a name and let me know if you know who it is. His name is Tiger Woods. Anyone know who Tiger Woods is? Uh, some people don't. He is a golf master. I mean, he has five green jackets, which means he's won five Masters. Now, last year, this time, he won his fifth Masters, and everyone went crazy. The internet broke, people broke, it was all over the news, it was hype, it was more hype than any other Master he won. And people were like, why would that make a difference if it was his fifth? He's already won four, he's had three Grand Slams, he's known as the best golfer to ever play the game, one of the best to ever play the game. Why was the fifth one so intense? Well, it's because it came after a great setback. If you guys don't know about Tiger Woods, Tiger actually in 2008 got injured, hurting his back, and so he kind of lost his golf uh, game. He lost his edge, and he got really in a bad spiral, and he actually had a DUI. He crashed into a fire hydrant. It was all over the news um, and because he got a DUI over it. He was having a sexual affair on his wife, and they got a divorce. It was all over the news as well. He had spinal surgery, which then he got hooked on the drugs after having the spinal surgery, and he was just spiraling. He went from the number one greatest golfer down to 1,199th. That is a setback. I don't know about you, but being the number one since you were a little kid and all of a sudden you realize that you are now 1,199th, he was in the biggest setback of his life, but it was his greatest setback that paved the way for the greatest comeback in sports history. We wouldn't have been celebrating the comeback if it wasn't for his setback. And we look at Samson, he was in a big setback. His eyes gouged out. He was wounded. He was in slavery because he made some mistakes along the way. He was now in his greatest setback, but it was his setback that paved the way for his greatest comeback. And I believe today, if you're here in this place and you say, I am wounded, I have scars, and I am in my biggest setback of life, in the presence of God, I want to tell you today that it may be your setback that is paving your way for your greatest comeback today. God can do it, and he is faithful to complete it. Some people don't even want to talk about it. I don't believe it, but you're looking at someone who had a great comeback when he was in the middle of a setback. No matter what decision you made when it comes to sex and sexual morality, or maybe it's other things, and you're in a place of setback, I just want to let you know today's message is this. It's time for a comeback. It's time for a comeback. I hope I can encourage you today to get your setbacks turned into the greatest comebacks because you're looking at someone that notices. And Samson did this. And we're going to learn from Samson life what he did so that he could have the greatest comeback of life so you can as well. But more, more than that, this was what I did in my life. Not saying it was Sean's strength, but as I look at these points, I'm like, oh my gosh. This is what allowed me, this depressed, suicidal, sex, porn addict guy, anxiety-ridden, OCD-ridden dude who was so miserable spiraling. God saved me, and he rescued me, and I believe it's these things, if you put them in the practice, that God can do a comeback in your life too. I do believe. God is the God of comebacks. He's the God of comebacks. The first thing we look at is this, position. Everyone write position. Everyone say position. 
Help me out. We're an interactive church. If you're new here, people talk a lot here. It's okay. As long as we're talking about the message, all right? Not, not what we're going to eat later. That's after. Position. Position is powerful. How are you positioned? In this case, Samson, his eyes are gouged out. He's in slavery. And then he's getting to take to a party where all the Philistines are. And in verse 26, he says something so specific. He says, Samson said to the young servant who was leading him by the hand, listen, he says, place my hands against the pillars that hold up the temple. I want to rest against them. Samson says, position myself between the two pillars. Samson already knew in his heart what he wanted to accomplish. Samson was positioning himself for victory. Samson was positioning himself for a comeback. My question for us today is, are we positioning ourselves for victory every day? Are we positioning ourselves for defeat every day? What are we positioning for? Because you'll always end up in the place that you are positioned in. Samson was positioning himself for victory. If we want to position ourselves for victory, we have to position ourselves in God's presence. How do we position ourselves in God's presence? Let me show you a scripture that the psalmist said so well. Psalms 92. The righteous, that's the right standing. If you are in Christ, you are in right standing with God. Listen, will flourish, they'll thrive, they'll grow. They won't be taken out like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in a house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. I love this scripture. Notice how I I highlighted the word um, palm tree and cedar. They used these two trees that people knew in that context. They used the cedar of Lebanon. Why? It was a strong, sturdy, resilient tree. It could could make it through the harshest conditions. He says you'll be like a cedar of Lebanon. But then he says you'll be like a palm tree. The cool thing about palm trees is they grow during opposition. It's actually the storms that cause them to grow faster. He says you can be like a palm tree. I got a picture of what it looks like a palm tree after a hurricane. Yeah, listen, I know they may be bending, but they're still standing. And some of us need to realize if we can learn how to position ourselves, you'll stop being uprooted every time the enemy comes. Who wants to be like a palm tree? You might be bending, but I'm still standing. Some of us just keep getting rooted up, and God's like, hey, I want to make you like a palm tree. I want to make you like a cedar of Lebanon. I want you to be resilient. In order for them to be resilient, listen, the trees have to be planted in the right soil. It says, planted in the house of the Lord. Position matters. Position matters. Tell me if you see a palm tree in the middle of the Midwest. (laughs) It needs specific soil. And just like a palm tree needs specific soil so it can bend and stand, we need specific soil so we can bend and stand. So what do we got to position ourselves? We're talking about position. Position ourselves in God's grace. God's grace, first and foremost, because some of us are so hung up on our condemnation and shame. If you are a believer and follower of Christ, you need to plant yourself in the grace of God. Do you know what that means? It means the undeserved favor of God for those who are in sin and condemnation, which means he died a death we should have died, and we get to live the life that he is designed to live, which means we acted like animals and sinned and treated everyone else like it, and he died like the animal that we live like. Which means we don't deserve this life, but by God's grace, while we were sinners, Christ still died for us. So if you are in a setback because of your sin and shame, you need to plant yourself in this. God has died for you. He has paid the price. Your sin is no longer held against you. He sees you as a child of God. You can move forward. No condemnation, no shame. You are blameless right now, a child of God. you got to plant yourself in there if you want to move forward. Otherwise, if you think you're condemned, you'll live condemned. People are like, oh, don't preach that message. You'll give them a license to sin. You'll never overcome your sin unless I preach a message like that. Because it's only by grace do we overcome sin. Plant yourself in God's grace. But listen, plant yourself in God's house. Position ourselves in God's house. Like, I'm here. I'm glad you're here. Thank you for making it. So you could be anywhere else. But I'm not talking about the brick and mortar of this old, like, right, Freaksers Roadhouse building. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. Scripture says that we are the living stones, that God builds us. We are the bricks. We are the house of God. So you're not just gathering in brick and mortar. You're gathering with the house right now. If you're viewing online, we're glad you're watching online. Keep doing it. But I would encourage you just one day to come join this house and watch how God can work in you. Some people, it blows my mind. Like, you wouldn't go to the gym twice a month and be like, what the heck? Where are my abs at? (laughs) But you come to church once a month, and you're like, why isn't anything changing? 
It, take, right, it, it, it took us 20 years to put on that weight with that eating lifestyle. It's not going to take two times to the gym to get it off. Give God some grace. Give, give him something to work with. Keep showing up. Some of us come once every two months. Listen, I'm just trying to say, try to be more consistent in the house of God and position yourself here. And sometimes you don't even know why it's working, but when you get around people like this, you become like a palm tree, resilient. Plant yourself in God's house. Plant yourself in God's word. Position yourself in God's word. It's alive. It's active. It's the truth of God that sets you free. If you want to stand firm, you got to quit getting knocked over by the lies of the enemy. If you want to quit getting knocked over by the lies of the enemy, you got to stand in the truth of God's word. Because if you know the truth, then you can spot the lie. Plant yourself in God's word. Get a reading plan. Read this daily. Start with one scripture. Start somewhere. Like, why does don't know where to start? Pick Matthew. Read it. It's really good. I promise you. You can start with Song of Solomon and read it to your husband. That's fine. Just read the Bible. The last thing is this. God's people. God's people. So we talk about groups here. You see, the cool thing about God's people is they show you your blind spot. They sharpen you. They protect you. When someone comes in, they say, I don't think this is a good idea. They want you to keep standing. We need to be positioned. Are you positioned for a victory or for defeat? Position yourself in God's grace, his house, his word, and his people. If you can continue to do that, keep showing up. I'm telling you, storms will come, but you'll just bend, and you won't get uprooted. Samson positioned himself. No more excuses, guys. Come on. No more excuses. It's time to say, what can we do as a family to continue to plant ourselves? What can I do as a single to continue to position myself? Where? Am I, that's your question today. Where am I positioned? Not that we just position ourselves, but that we also have to focus on prayer. We talk a lot about prayer in this church, but we can't experience a comeback without a life of prayer. We cannot experience a comeback without a life of prayer. And some people think prayer, it's like, I would pray, Sean, but I don't know how to do it. If you can complain, you can pray. <laughs> just talk to God. I'm just talking about experience. If you can complain, you can pray. He just says, just talk to me. Look at verse 28. Samson's now in position. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, sovereign Lord, remember me again. Oh, God, please strengthen me just one more time. With one blow, let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. He couldn't win a supernatural battle with a natural weapon. Samson realized, if I'm going to win this supernatural thing, i got to stop using my natural weapons. i got to do some supernatural weapons. i got to pray. i got to worship. i got to get in God's word. I need spiritual weapons to take out a spiritual enemy. He says, I'm going to pray. Isn't it ironic that Samson was praying for strength? Like, throughout his entire life, you never see him praying for strength. The power would just come upon him. But the moment he was weak, he realized where his strength came from. And sometimes God will allow us to live our life until we get to a point to realize the strength was never coming from us. It was coming from him. And he realized, he said, God, I need strength right now. He was weak. His hair was cut. He couldn't see. But it's not just what Samson prayed. It's when he prayed. At his weakest. At his weakest. Church, if we can learn how to pray in our weakest, we'll come out strong. It's okay to be weak. We get, lion blasted, we get scared by it, and we let the enemy land blast us in our weakness and say, you're not worth it. But God says, no, it's in your weakness that I want you to pray. Paul, the apostle Paul, we always talk about him. He was Saul, killing Christians. Jesus, he had an encounter with Jesus. He says, no more persecuting my Christians. You're going to preach to them. He's building the churches. He's writing to the church of Corinth in 2 Corinthians, and he talks about his weaknesses. Like Samson had a weakness moment. Paul had a weakness moment. We all have weakness moments. And I love what he says when he's talking about a weakness he has that he can't get rid of. I don't know about you. If, this is, if you're here and you don't have a weakness, this church is not for you. But if you're here and you have a thorn in your side and you feel like you pray for that thing to leave and it's still there sometimes tormenting you, this church is for you. Because this is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. He says, even though I received such a wonderful revelation from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Listen, three different times I begged. Can I say it this way? Three different times I prayed. Did you know when you were begging God you were praying? Three times I approached God. I said, Lord, take this thing away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. Listen, my power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. Paul had a thorn, and I'm sure we all have thorns too. I know I have a thorn. 
I know there's some things in my life where I keep begging God to take. I'm like, God, why can't you take this away? And people will try to figure out what the thorn is. Listen, I have a feeling that if they told us what Paul's thorn was, then we would identify with it and be like, oh, I don't have that. But the fact that he left it unspecified kind of reacts that we all can have a thorn in our life. There's something that we struggle with that we are begging God to take away from us. And we don't know why we keep dealing with it. But listen, when he was weak, it pushed him into prayer. When Samson was weak, he prayed. When you find your weakness, you can find your strengths. Let me explain this. When we get team members and managers and I hire staff here at our church, I never hire people who are my strengths. That would be pointless. I can do that. I hire where my weaknesses are because I have a lot of them. You're like, why do we have so many people? Because Sean's weak in a lot of areas. I don't hire my strengths. I hire my weaknesses. For instance, I do not like Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> Our communications director who just went, whoo! Loves Excel spreadsheets. She's on our staff. She knows that when I come up to a point where we need an Excel or we need a spreadsheet or organization or administrative details, if I do it on my own strength, she's like, don't do that. Like, don't do that. What do I do? When I come up to a moment where I feel weak, I say, hey, Rachel, can you make me look good? (laughs) She goes, absolutely. And the thing is, you look at me on stage, and the truth of the matter is, God is so good at making people look good. Like, oh, man, he preaches so like this. and all that. I can tell you, by, I don't have a good, I don't have good grammar. You should see people who have to edit my paragraphs and I write. I don't got good punctuation. I don't know words sometimes. I stutter. I don't know any of this stuff. But what I do know when I am weak, I run to God's presence, and he makes me look a whole lot better than what I am. Don't let me fool you. This is God up here. This is not Sean. <clears throat> what did I do? In my weakness, I ran to my strength. We were strong because I knew where to run to. When I am weak, listen, it didn't matter what I knew. It mattered who I was connected with. And when you are weak, if you run to the right source, you can find your strength. Where we run to when we are weak will determine our comeback. Let me say that again. Where we run to when we are weak will determine our comeback. You're going to keep running back to him every time you're weak? You won't get your comeback. You're going to run back to the bar every time you're weak? You're not going to find your comeback. You're going to run back to that food and the anxiety. You're going to run back to that every time. You will not find your comeback. But if you can learn in your weakness, say, God, I cannot do this without your strength. I got to get to the house of God. I got to get in your word. When you learn how to run to his presence in your weakness, I'm telling you, you'll have the greatest comeback you'll ever see in your life. When you know your weakness, you know your strength. Let me give you an example. Before I preach up here, I have a tendency to care more what you think about me than what God thinks about me. It's a weakness. It's a thorn. I, I sometimes want to impress you more than impact you. It's a weakness. It's a thorn. So when we're worshiping during Surrounded, I'm saying, God, I'm preparing my heart. Lord, I don't want to go up there. It's, I love these people so much, but it's not, I, I'm not doing this for their approval. I'm doing this for yours. God, I need, cause, God, I need you. I, I don't want to impress them. I just want to make sure that they hear this message and it impacts them for your kingdom. Holy Spirit, help me. Why? Because when I realized my weakness, I went to my strength. And when we're talking about the life and death power of sex and romance, if pornography is your weakness, admit it and let God be your strength. Don't do this in your own strength. Some of you say, oh, but when he comes in the room, my knees go weak. He's just so good looking. But every time you go home with him, you feel awful. That's your weakness. It's okay. You have a weakness. Run to God for your strength. Oh, that chocolate cake from Portillo's is sounding really, really, really good. You didn't think about it until I said it. And now you're like, God, I need you. Portillo's is not my source. God, you are my source. Where do you run to when you are weak? Here's the practical step I'm trying to say. When I get attention from the opposite sex who is not my spouse, I like it. Oh, can the pastor say that? Can we be real? You like it. It's good to feel appreciated from someone maybe who isn't nagging you every day. Oh, too real? It's good to have that, but that's a thorn. And if you follow that thorn, it will end in destruction. So what do you do when you're weak? God, I really want that attention, but help me be strong. Help me be strong. I'm just trying to teach you that if you have a weakness, you have a prayer life. Every time you see your weakness, run to God. Samson knew his weakness, so I feel the spirit here. When you find your weakness, you can find your strength. When your weakness is weak, 
drop to your knees. You're like, show them there's people around you. Say it under your breath. Focus on God and pray. And the last thing is this. You got to push. You got to position yourself. You got to pray in your weak moments. When you're weak and your hair is cut and you don't know how you're going to do this in, in your own strength, you got to pray and you got to push. I love this in this moment. Samson, look at what happens. It says in verse 29, he, after he prayed for strength, then Samson put his hands on the two center pillars that held up the temple, pushing against them with both hands. And we find out, it comes down, he kills more Philistines then than he did his entire last, lifetime. But you have to understand, guys, if, you're gonna position our, if we're going to position ourselves and we're going to pray for strength, we better be willing to push when God says push. Because the whole purpose you're positioning yourself and the whole purpose you're praying for strength is so you can push. So when you push because you like the attention from that lady, or when you pray because you like the attention from that person, now you got to push and turn, right, turn the other way and begin to put things in store so that you don't give in to it. Let me give you an example for this. Uh, there's this guy that works out at the gym with me, and every time he comes in, I can tell you his routine every single time. He comes in, he goes to the vending machine, he gets a bang energy drink. Has anyone ever had a bang energy drink before and survived? <laughs> Anybody? Like, there's 300 milligrams of caffeine in a bang energy drink. A lot of people who lift use it for pre-workout, meaning it gives them the energy they need to push the weight they want to push. So he chugs the bang, he's drinking it, he goes to the treadmill, puts it on the incline, walks for a little bit. This guy's way bigger than I am, not that I'm big. But anyways, he's walking, and all of a sudden, after he's done, you can tell he's geared up, and he goes and he just starts throwing weight around. I mean, he's pushing, he's jacked, he's getting big. Could you imagine if he came in, drank the bang, walked for a little bit, left? You pay $25 a month for that? And you pay extra for the bang? We'd be like, what is he doing? And then could you imagine if he complained that he never saw the results he wanted? See, the thing is, is he positioned himself in the right place. He was in the gym. He put in him the strength and energy he needed to push. But you got to push. And some of us are really good at coming. I'm in a position, Sean. I've been doing God's word. I've been in the house of God. I've been coming. I've been praying. I've been doing this. I, I promise I have. But you haven't taken your wife out on a date night yet. You haven't pushed. You haven't. Samson wasn't praying for strength just to sit there and let God, okay, God, give me strength to see this wall come up. No, give me strength to push. Give me strength to do what I can do in the natural so you can show up and do what only you can do in the supernatural. Do you want to come back? If you want to come back and say, okay, we're going to get in the group. Get in a group. Find a group that you can get. We have authentic groups here. It's a community of people where you can learn to do life. I promise you, you don't want to slip through the cracks when you're going through a hard time. Get around people who can encourage you. But people say, well, I got social anxiety. I'm sorry. That's tough. And maybe you're here today. I know that is difficult. That's your weakness. That's a thorn. But what you can do is you can sign up for a group. And then when your weakness comes, I'm not going to show up. I'm not going to show up. Lord, give me strength to show up. Give me strength to show up. And then push yourself and show up. Church, we have got to start pushing ourselves more in the right aspects. We position ourselves, we pray, and we push. Do you want to come back? Stop going to places that leave you defeated. Man, but the opposite sex is my weakness. Well, position yourself in God's word, pray for strength every time you're tempted, and push yourself to find another area to hang out at. God wants to tell us today, listen, we can sit and pray until the cows come home, but if you're never going to push, I mean, like, we prayed for this to happen. Could you imagine if we were still praying in my living room? God, you're going to do it. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. Woo! <laughs> All right, good meeting, church. We'll see you next week, right? And we never, like, put the money together. We never bought things. We never built a strategic plan on how we're going to do this. We never figured out how long it's going to be and what this is going to look like. We never reached out to Mr. Baum at the school and said, hey, can we rent this place? And we never did any of that. But we're like, yeah, Jesus, we're going to reach so many people. And a week later, a month later, two years, God, God didn't show up. And I think we blame God a whole lot of, we give God a whole lot of blame because we're not willing to push. Well, he doesn't want to give me a spouse. No, he wants you to take a shower. Start there, and then there, then fill out an application. 
fill out a resume and get a job. Because I'm telling you, the girl that you're praying for, she doesn't want some smelly person with no money who can't take her out to Cold Stone and get some cake at Portillo's. I'm not trying to be on your case. I guess what I'm trying to say is don't pray for something you're not going to push for. God would tell you the same thing. Why? Because I said it to Moses. Exodus 14, 13 through 15. It says this. Moses answered the people. So this is them. They're at the Red Sea. They're about ready to get taken out by the Egyptians. They're stuck. They can't go anymore. Everyone's yelling out to God. God, why'd you leave us here to die? What is going on? Look at this. Moses answered the people. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you'll see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today will never see again. Look at The Lord will fight for you. Leave it here. You only need to be still. I love this, right? The Lord is going to fight for you. Just be still. Right? Like, we love that. It's great. Just, just be still. And we should be still. God says to be still. <laughs> but Moses says, be still. And look at what happens in verse 15 when God hears this. He goes, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. <laughs> He says, get your butt in gear. And while they moved, the ocean split. What is God saying here? You do what's in the natural and watch God show up in the supernatural. Watch him do more than you could ever do in your own strength. I believe that, I believe that Samson was weak. This isn't scripture. I believe he was weak, but he just decided whatever strength he had, he was going to push. And when he did that, God's like, I can work with that. Woo! And some of us want some financial breakthrough, but we don't want to push when it's time to be generous as a church. And God says, no, watch me work in this. Some of us don't want to serve other people, even though it looks like Jesus when we serve. And God's like, watch me work in this. Some people feel like, I I can't do that. That doesn't look, that doesn't amount to anything. Just go in the strength you have after you pray and watch God do something supernaturally. If I'm looking at my life, that's where I got to where I am today. I positioned myself. (laughs) I prayed when I was weak, and I prayed a lot because I am weak a lot. And I pushed when God said, now it's time to step out. What is God asking you to step out of? And what is he asking you to step into? you got to push or you'll be in the same place next year. This is time for your comeback. Push in the natural and God will show up. So we have to push ourselves. We position, we pray, and we push. Push to stay pure before marriage. Push to defeat your porn addiction. Push, push, push. Just keep showing up and keep pushing. Talking from experience. You can't have your comeback. And maybe you're here today, and you're like, I've already feel defeated, Sean. This is good stuff, but I feel so broken. I feel like the enemy's already won. Well, look at verse 23 when they had Samson. It says, the Philistine rulers held a great festival offering sacrifices and praising their god, Dagon. They said, our god has given us victory over our enemy, Samson. Listen, this is very important. It says right here that they literally thought they had won. They were celebrating. And in the middle of their celebration, God defeated the enemy. Samson is a great picture of a comeback, but can I tell you who's a greater picture? Jesus. Jesus is the greatest comeback story of all time. We have actual manuscripts from 500 eyewitnesses that saw Jesus die, and then he rose again, and they wrote about their experience, and we still have these manuscripts to this day. And if there's a man who says that he will die and rise again, if he, could, well, if he could actually predict that, I'm going with him. Jesus did this. You're like, Sean, how was Jesus' the comeback story? Well, the comeback story was we were the ones that sinned. We are separated from God the moment we sin. All of us sin. That's our weakness. Now we are positioned as slaves. What did Jesus do? He positioned himself. Big setback in humanity. Jesus came into earth. And position himself around us. God put on flesh and bone for us. Position himself, not just there, but on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin so that we could be set free from sin. He positioned himself. But not just that, he prayed when he was weak. In scripture, the night before he went to the cross, it said, Lord, if you can take this cup from me, I don't want to do this. But your will be done. He says he was in agony and dripping sweat. In his weakness, what did he do? He prayed so that he could follow through for you and I. He positioned himself on the cross. He prayed himself through. And when he died, he killed sin. But then three days later, he pushed and the grave door opened. And he walked out alive. And scripture says that we have a high priest 
who can sympathize for us because he's been through every testing and temptation we've been through without sinning. And he says that we can approach his throne of grace with confidence in our time of need, and he will help us. We've got to position ourselves. We've got to pray, and we've got to push. We've got to push. See, Jesus' story is the comeback story. Jesus came back from the grave so you can come back from your setback. If you're here today, I was praying for you this week because it hurts to be in a place that you feel like you can't get up. If you're here today, <clears throat> I believe the Holy Spirit is working and he's doing something supernatural. I'm going to ask, I'm going to push you. I'm going to ask you, I'm just going to push you for a moment in this moment. We're going to pray for you. But if you're here and you said, Sean, this has been speaking to my heart. I feel like I'm in a setback. Maybe it hasn't been because of the stuff we've been talking about, the sexual addictions. Maybe it's because of anything else. You, you just found yourself because of the decisions you've made. You're in a setback and you're in a desperate need of a comeback. I want to pray for you, but I'm going to ask you to push yourself. I believe if you do something in the natural, God can do something supernaturally. If that's you, could you just rise up real fast? Could you just stand up to your feet and say, maybe it's my marriage, maybe it's me personally. Thank you for being courageous. Stand up. If it's any way I say this is me, I want to pray for you right now. Come on, let's celebrate people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you're here, this is your first time, it says in Scripture that we join in together with prayer. So if you're near someone, if you still need to stand up, you need to stand up right now. We're going to pray. But if you're near someone, we're going to stand together. We're going to put our hands, if you're in a, put them on their shoulder, please. Like, put it on their shoulder. We're going to pray for these people right now. I believe God is up to a comeback in these people's lives. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name for your spirit. I thank you, Father God, right now for a comeback. I thank you for those who made a choice to push. They're not just positioned in the right place, which they are. They're not just praying for a miracle. They are. But, Lord, I believe that they are now pushing, Father God. And I believe as a church that we would help push with them, that we would push together. I pray, Lord, that they would realize no matter the mistakes they made up to this point, your grace has covered it. They are blameless. They are brand new. No more living in the past. There's nothing back there. It's all about moving forward today, Lord. I pray right now for the strength and the tenacity and the audacious faith to continue. Continue to push. Holy Spirit, you rose Christ from the dead, and because you did that, you can rise us from the dead as well. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's celebrate all those people who stood up. Come on, that's amazing. Praise God.